Matthew 25, 31 through 40. <clears throat> when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needed clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So be it. Before I pray, um, let me just remind you of the songs that Debbie did and the scripture that we read about what we are called to do, that we're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And I want to stress again, because my heart does break for my brothers and sisters that are serving in a capacity, I won't say far greater than mine, but they chose to give up this world to go where the need was. And they are struggling. They're fighting a spiritual battle that's strong, and they're, you know, getting, I won't say depressed, but Satan is really, really attacking them, which means that we're doing the right thing, guys. <laughs> we're going to fight these spiritual battles, and we're going to be attacked, but we know that we have the victory in Jesus. So all we've got to do is cling to him and fix our eyes on him and keep on working hard, but we need to pray for our brothers and sisters especially. Father in heaven, we just do thank you and praise you, Lord. We thank you for the freedoms that we have. We thank you for Beth and for Troy and Cora and, and uh, Troy and Cora's family and everything, Lord. We pray also for the other volunteers and helpers. And Lord, we can't really imagine the things that they're facing and everything, but as a partner of ministry, as, as one in the spirit and one in mind, that, that we are your hand and feet in this world, Lord. We join with them in spirit and in prayer and lift them up, Lord, for the, for the cause of spreading the gospel message, for the cause of loving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and body, Lord, and to love others, Lord, even our enemies. Father, Lord, let us not to be uh, thinking of things of this world, but to use the things that you have given us to be rich to others. Father, we just thank you and praise you for the freedom that we have to come and Study your word today, Lord, and may your words pierce our hearts, and may your spirit transform us into the image of Christ. Use us, Lord, to further your kingdom. We pray this in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. So I entitled this, Part or No Part? And then if Kim put the parentheses, that is the question. Get that? Part or no part, that is the question. Doesn't that sound familiar? Like to be or not to be, that is the question? You familiar with that? If you've been washed, then you are saved. We looked at that last week in John 13. But then Jesus went on to tell Peter he needed his feet washed. And, in, and Peter's, you know, at, vehemently denied having his feet washed. No way was Jesus going to wash his feet. But then Jesus explained that if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part of me. And I told you how I felt about that. You may read scripture a little differently, but Jesus was doing a ceremonial thing here to show Peter that he was washing his feet for service. You do see humble service in that passage. 
But unless you go and do those things, and that can mean going where you're at, you don't have to go overseas and everything, are you really understanding why Jesus washed your feet? And if we go together, guess what? Our feet are going to get dirty as we go, and we're going to need to wash each other's feet. And I'm so glad that I got to talk to, to Beth and Troy this week to see some more burdens and things that they're, they're fighting in their ministry so that I can at least be here to pray for them, and we are helping them financially and other things as well. But, you know, both of, both of them said during talking to me, thank you, because just the talking and the concern helped a lot to know that they're not fighting this battle alone that we are one body one mind one spirit one savior the lord jesus christ serving one god who is in complete control of every single thing time space everything else and he loves you enough that he would send his one and only son to die for you wow i can rest in peace no matter what the situation is well, the part or no part comes from Hamlet, a quote from Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing in them. Wow, sounds like that goes right along with Jesus' mission for us, doesn't it? Because the victory is in Christ. So the question is to be or not to be. Are you going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you going to be a soldier? Are you going to fight the good fight? Are you going to study to show thyself approved? Are you going to love even your enemy? Are you going to sell everything you have if need be so that nothing else holds the purse strings in your life so that you can go and follow Jesus? So that you can take up your cross after you've denied yourself and followed Jesus? Because it's going to lead to some suffering. But we suffer less than probably the church, anyone in the church in this country. That's just my opinion again. And so we have the most opportunity right now. We have the most opportunity to live dangerously like Barnabas did in Acts chapter 4. Not like Ananias and Sapphira did in Acts chapter 5. Yeah, I'm going there. <laughs> we have two bold examples but one that was boldly, boldly audacious to sell his piece of land and give it all. Versus one that said, hey, hey, wife of mine, let's conspire together. Let's sell land and give some and hold some back. And it's not about what they gave and what they didn't give. It's about that heart again. Your feet, if you've let Jesus wash your feet, have been washed for ministry. Not for partial ministry, but for ministry. And then you need to wash others' feet. And maybe, just maybe, if we be instead of not be, which is the question, and we're nobler in mind to suffer, even slings and arrows which we're not, for this outrageous fortune to take arms against sin and the devil and by so opposing them. Jesus tells us that the devil has no authority. He took the authority from the devil when he died on the cross. Death has no power. There is no sting. And so we've been called. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus and saved. And he's washed your feet if, he, if you allow him to, first thing. And second of all, then you've got to serve. Because even Judas's feet were washed. So or will you serve the kingdom? Jesus said clearly, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So what does that part mean? Well, if we look at Scripture, Matthew 15, 21, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon, the part of Tyre and Sidon, a part that made up a hole, made up a hole, get this, a part that makes up a hole in a region, in land we're talking about here. Luke eleven thirty six. 36, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it is dark, no part of it, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines, shines its light on you. Can you think about the rest of the scripture that should be flowing through your mind there and how you're supposed to let your light shine? But if there's any part that is darkness, the light is not going to shine correctly. What part does darkness have with light? 
Hasn't Jesus enlightened you? Hasn't He given you His light? Luke 12, 46. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he is unaware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with unbelievers. The word there that's the same word that I've said is part and region so far is a place with the unbelievers. A place over here where unbelievers go because that's your part in it. You make up that hole of people who don't believe, who will die in their sins and face a eternity, an eternity apart from God. I won't even say what the eternity is like. Just think about the fact that it's apart from God. All the things that, that trouble you and everything now are things that aren't a part of God. Because everything that is a part of God is good and wholesome and kind and loving and merciful and great and peaceful. So regardless of flames or anything else, you won't have all of those good things if you're not a part of God, if you're a part of this other set of unbelievers. Luke 15, 12. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share, my part of the estate. So he divided his property between them. You know, we have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. We have a bank account of God at our disposable. We have the Spirit of God that hovered over darkness and created order and life out of non-life and chaos, out of nothing, literally. We have the same Spirit that led Jesus through His ministry, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, He resides in each and every believer. And we've seen how the Holy Spirit has empowered them, filled them so far in Acts. Three fillings so far, and each time they spoke boldly. And the third time was in the sight of persecution. They, the uh, church did not pr pray for boldness to the threats. They prayed for boldness so that they could preach because they knew the threats would be a part of it. They knew they would suffer. Their property would be confiscated. Their life would be threatened. Maybe their life would be lost. So they prayed for boldness all in one accord so that they could share the message that they had because their feet had been washed and they were going to get them dirty. And they were going to do this together and they were all of one mind and one accord. All. So you can think forward a little bit and see how that someone who then changed and is not a part of them would cause a serious problem to the church. <clears throat> And if you notice here in Luke 15, 12, the whole part here is, goes back to the Ten Commandments and everything else. Uh, commandment number 10, thou shalt not covet. Two brothers, family. Oh, let's go back to Cain and Abel again. I want what this one has. I want this. It's all about me. It's not about my father's kingdom. It's not about loving my brother. It's about me. Give me my part. Luke 24, verse 42, they gave him a piece of broiled fish. This is when Jesus comes up to them, and they offer Jesus a part, a piece of this fish. The fish is the whole. The part that was eaten is part of the whole. Are you getting the picture? And these are the, the Greek words used, that we should be a part of Jesus, and if you don't let him wash your feet, you have no part with him. But you've got to do the rest of it just like... The, the hear and obey, O Israel. The hear is understood that I've got to obey. The washing my feet is understood that I've got to then go and do likewise. Because if I have my feet washed and I don't go do service, what good did it do for Jesus to wash my feet? I've got to be His hands and feet in this world. And then Acts 5, 2... With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. He didn't have to give it all. No one told him to give it all. He could have given a part, but the way he did it in his heart, conspiring to lie to the Holy Spirit, as Peter says, is he divided that part. He tore it apart. Do you follow that? 
Just like the piece was tore from the fish. Just like I want my part of that inheritance. Just like there's a part of the land that's one part, but it's a whole. Ananias said in his heart, and I, I take this back to the deception of Satan in the garden again. <laughs> Except we had Satan go after Eve here that then tempted Adam. Now here we've got the husband that should be leading his wife that he knows he's part of the church. He knows that Jesus has loved the women just as much and come to set the captives free and everything. And he conspires with his wife. He fell to temptation and then Adam did too. I mean, you can go look right back and read it and read it any differently. But he conspired with his wife to sin by bringing division into the church. Wow. And not just into the church, but into the church that was all one mind, all one accord, that said, yes, we're ready to suffer and die with you, Jesus. The message is worth it. Oh, we can't do this without you. Please give us boldness to preach the gospel. And the place was shaken and they were filled with the Spirit again. And we know that the Spirit was there because the Scripture says, but the place was shaken. It wasn't an earthquake. It was the power of God shaking the place because they said, we're united in this mission. And then there's an incredible example of one guy, but then the opposing example of someone else. There's a thing of being saved. There's a thing of your, the works that you do burning up, but you escaping through the flames. But Jesus clearly said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. He told Peter that. He went on to say in John 13, just so to remind you that, those who have had a bath need only, need only this, to wash their feet because their whole body is clean. You don't understand now what I'm doing, but you'll understand it later. I'm washing your feet in preparation to serve me because it is not going to be easy. We're going to fight a spiritual battle. I know from talking to Troy and Beth, they're both real close to throwing in the towel. You know? I mean, the last thing Troy said to me is he said, you know, it was nice at Bonner's Ferry not even having to wear a mask. <laughs> a trivial thing is that. It's not the mask that he's wearing. It's everything else that goes with the mask. And now they've robbed his son from him of being adopted. Who knows if that'll change? Pray. Pray earnestly for it. Like I said, Beth's ministry, they don't know what to do. You know, things continue to get worse. And their helpers aren't coming back. She's very frustrated, very tired. Her body's, you know, and age is getting up there to the points where when we get up in the morning, we're like, what's going to work? What's not going to work? What's going to hurt? What's not going to hurt? But she feels called to be there. And it's just even going to cost her coming home to spend a little time here. You have no part with Jesus if you don't allow him to cast you off into service. All authority in heaven and on earth was given to Jesus. He said, go therefore and make disciples. Not just teach them, not just tell them about Jesus, but make disciples to teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. And I will say this again, and I'll say this again, and I'll say this again. If you're not obeying what Jesus did, how are you going to teach your children to obey? Aren't they going to see hypocrisy, which you can continue to see through Scripture again, which, guess what? The hypocrites had no part with Jesus, did they? And they were actually blind, leading the blind into destruction, weren't they? You've been washed for service to go and serve wherever that may be, to be a whole, to be united as a church, as a body, building parts, building on Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone, not building on something else, living a life that is far into this world. I'm going to answer Troy back tonight because he's a different time than I am about the mask. I'm going to say, well, if you've got to wear the mask on the outside, make your heart smile so much they see Jesus, you know, by the way you live. That's what Scripture tells us. To let our light shine. So even if a mask is covering up our face, they'll know that our heart is shining. They'll know that we're at peace. And he needs our prayers. He needs us to be prayer warriors to help him there. So at the end of Acts chapter 4, the church is dedicated to this mission. 
even though it may cost them their life. So much so that there's this act of charity, this act of compassion, this act of mercy, that they didn't call for it to happen, but it just happened because the Spirit compelled them to. That some among them sold what they had and gave it at the apostles' feet. In so much that there were none in needs. And if you read that again, you'll see that God did mighty wonders among them. Well, let's just read it again. Let me go right here and I'll just read the passage. Because I don't have it printed out here. I think I can even find it. Let's see. Genesis. No, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. <clears throat> Starting in verse 31 of chapter 4. I don't have my glasses either, Debbie. So, After they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke God's word without fear, is what my translation says. The group of believers were united in their hearts and spirit. All those in the group acted as though their private property belonged to everyone in the group. I like reading this version instead. In fact, they shared everything. With great power, the apostles were telling people that the Lord Jesus was truly raised from the dead. And God blessed all the believers very much. There were no needy people among them. From time to time, those who owned fields or houses sold them and brought the money and gave it to the apostles. Then the money was given to anyone who needed it. One of the believers was named Joseph, a Levite born in Cyprus. The apostles called him Barnabas, which means one who encourages. Joseph owned a field, sold it, brought the money, and gave it to the apostles. Reading straight through, but, but, see that but there? <laughs> a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold some land. He kept back part of the money for himself. The wife knew about this and agreed to it. But he brought the rest of the money and gave it to the apostles. Peter said, Ananias, why do you let Satan rule your thoughts to lie to the Holy Spirit, to keep for yourself part of the money you receive for the land? Before you sold that land, it belonged to you, and even after you sold it, you could have used the money for anything that you wanted. Why did you think of doing this? You lied to God, not to us. Then when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Some young men came in, wrapped up his body, carried it out, and buried it. And everyone who heard about this was filled with fear. About three hours later, after his wife came in, but she did not know what had happened, Peter said to her, Tell me, was the money that you got from, this, from selling your field this much? Sapphira answered, Yes, that was the price. Peter said to her, Why do you and your husband, why did you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. At that moment, Sapphira fell down by his feet and died. When the young men came in and saw what, that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. The whole church and the others who heard about these things were filled with great fear. That section starts off with, go back to... Kim, or maybe even before, well, before that when I started talking about the peas. Prayer. Started with prayer. That's why I'm asking you to pray today for the spiritual battle that our, that our brothers and sisters are facing. After they prayed, because they were of one of mine, one accord, nothing in this world mattered to them, not even suffering. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting, meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All spoke the word of God boldly again. Unity, not division. Unity, but division. Those things are two opposites. <clears throat> they knew what they would face. They knew the persecutions that they would face. But Jesus had washed their feet for ministry. They were going to do that. They were going to do it together. Verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. They all felt this way so much. It was such a driving part of their heart that no one claimed that any of their possessions was, were their own. That's, that's going to be a hard point to get to in unison unless it's a God thing that does it. 
Every one of us in here says, yep, nothing that I own is mine. I'll give it all to the kingdom. They all shared that heart because nothing was more important than telling people that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and if they would put their faith and trust in Him, they would have eternal life. And that Jesus was returning and He would separate the sheep from the goat. Goats. And as Merle said, Jesus says plainly, how did, how, how, why? Well, you were there and you fed me. You clothed me. You gave me shelter. Well, when did we do that? When you did that for others. Because I know that you love me because you love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. So you just couldn't help loving others. And it was shown by the way you lived. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. You know, that's what heaven looks like, guys. <laughs> so why wouldn't we want that now? Except that we want to continue to hold on like that one brother. Give me my part. And I, I want to put my trust in things. And, and I, I don't want to fear what man can do to me. But Jesus settled all that on the cross. You know how much you're loved. You know God is in control of everything, knows everything. And His plan right now is to build His kingdom through you. Through a prayerfully, dependently, powerfully lived, powerfully filled, I'm doing all the P's again, not exactly like I did them, purposeful life until Jesus returns. They were good stewards. You know the verses that go with that of what Jesus had given them. And you know that story, I think, about that rich man? They were rich to others. Remember that rich man, what happened to him? Remember him? That night his life was required. Ooh, that rings echoes in my head and in my ears. Because what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? That day their life was taken from them. God required it. So if you want some homework, I do this for... Um, the Awana children. Go back and read Luke chapters 10, 11, and 12. There's so much there that will set up this story that Jesus talked about, warned about, taught about, you know, everything there, including Luke chapter 12 where that rich man is that built bigger barns for himself. You'll see what Jesus teaches about the kingdom. Chapter 10 starts out with him sending the 70 or the 72 disciples, however your translation is on that. And then chapter 11 begins with Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. Teach us how to pray, Jesus. And then chapter 12 gets into religious hypocrisy. And then we even get this example of this foolish guy who God was rich to. He wasn't rich to others, and God required his life that night. Sounds a lot like we're reading that really happened in the church. <clears throat> who... Do you have a part with? That story in Luke 12 is prompted by this question. Verse 13. Someone in the crowd said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus, split apart what's supposed to be a whole. That's what I want you to do. Because my mind and my heart's not focused on serving you. Split that apart. Isn't that exactly what Ananias and Sapphira were doing when, they let, when Ananias let Satan tempt him and say, hey, you don't have to give it all. Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? You know, that's how he said it, right? Did God really say you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? Eve over here. No, that's not what he said. He said we can't eat from that tree. And then she goes on to say what you don't read in Scripture prior to that. We can't even touch it. Because God didn't want the temptation there. But you won't read that prior to that. Eve knew that. So God gave her more thorough instructions and Adam more thorough, thorough instructions. We find that she knew exactly. But Satan said, did he really say? And right here we have Satan filling Ananias' his heart and his mind. Do you really have to give it all? No, you don't. You know, I don't, Satan. I don't at all. But that ain't where he went with it. He went, oh, yeah. Let's conspire about it. 
We can look like we gave it all, like the rest of them, or we can get back, keep this part for us for security because we don't trust in God. We trust in things. We're in this mission half-heartedly. I know Jesus washed my feet, but I'm not going to serve fully. I know I'm putting a lot into this. I'm embellishing the story if you want to say that, but it's, it's there from scriptures because Jesus gives us firm commands. Didn't, didn't he say not to build treasures on earth? If I told my child not to do something and they did it, would they not be disobeying me? And then there's the but. Instead, here's what I do want you to do. Build treasures in heaven. We don't look at that verse usually as a command, but it's there. Don't eat those cookies and go clean your room. Don't eat the cookies. You go back and the cookies are ate. Dude, you're in trouble. <laughs> you didn't listen to me. And it's all because of what we desire, what we covet, what, what, we, what we want rather than what God told us. And specifically, I told you to go do your room and you didn't do that either. Go, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. So which way does the Acts chapter 4 church look? It looks like a church that's united. They don't care about anything in this world but serving Jesus. And then we get this encouraging example. Verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meet, meeting in chapter 4 of Acts, they were fill, all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but instead they shared everything they had. I'm emphasizing those things because it's all there. With great power, the apostles continued to testify. To testify about what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Look at all of those positive things going on in the church that are amazing. A people that don't live as a part of this world, that are living as aliens to this world. Verse 34, they did so that there were no needy persons among them. And then we have a preposition. For, it's tying all this together. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. They brought the money from the sales, and they put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone, again, who had need. Now, I'm not saying God could not have worked through them. Don't get me this way. But this all started because the Spirit came upon them and changed them so that they didn't care about things, so they sold them so that there were no people in need so the apostles could go out. And we're going to see a time coming back where the, the apostles get caught up in the distribution of this. It becomes so great. But because they gave up the things of this world, God worked through these people. Verse 36, we get an example. And the reason I say it this way is because they were given two examples back to back. Okay? Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, for the apostles called Barnabas, whom the apostles called Barnabas, he was encouraging to the 12. Don't forget that. So you know he's encouraging to the 70 or 72. He's encouraging to the, are we up to 3,000 or 5,000 now? 5,000 now, I think. He's encouraging to the 5,000, and that's plus uh, women and children again. He is this encouraging guy that stands out among the crowd. If anybody's doing things right, it's Barnabas over there. Check out what he's doing, okay? And his name literally means son of encouragement. If you don't think God's in sovereign control of things, look at these names. It's the irony that's in that or the sovereignty of God that's in that. He, verse 37, sold a field, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. End of story. It's not mine. It's yours. Use it for God's kingdom. No trying to build myself up. Oh, wait a minute. He's a Levite also. Did you notice that? Now, don't go running too far on the Levite because the first thing that you probably think of is he shouldn't own land. That's not necessarily the truth. Study to show thyself approved. The, the clan of Levi, the tribe of Levi, were not landowners. They could own land. You'll go back through the Old Testament and see that they did. And maybe he wasn't following. Maybe that's what he convicted his heart, whatever. 
But that makes me think of that Good Samaritan story that Jesus told, right? Where a priest passed by, and then a Levite passed by, but then this guy over here that don't know nothing about religion because he serves a mixture of God and other things was the one who had compassion and did for the person in need. Priest. Okay, well, that's that guy over there. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's not. It's you and I because Peter calls us priests. We're a royal priesthood. And Joseph, he's a Levite even. Yeah, he should be doing things, but yeah, we're priests. We should be doing things even more and not leaving them up to government to take care of or other religions to take care of. We should be doing it. Anyway, to go away from the, the Levite part, he sold this and gave it because he didn't consider it to be his own, just like the rest of the church. But he's an encouraging example. We want to look at him. And as we read on, we'll see that Saul or Paul looked at him for encouragement. If you do or your homework, you'll find that um, Good Samaritan story in there too in Luke chapter 10, just by the way. The parable of the Good Samaritan was prompted, Jesus told it, because a religious hypocrite, one who should have been leading the people, one who should be saved, the one who should be doing, going and doing, he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a big question. But the man didn't learn anything. He didn't go do anything that we see of this. And then Jesus exposed the man instead. He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And then in verse 36, he asked the question right back in our laps. He exposes our religious hypocrisy if we have it. Which of these three do you think? was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers. Go ahead. Answer the question. You don't have to answer it out loud. You know it was the Samaritan. That's why we call the story the Good Samaritan. The story doesn't say he was a Good Samaritan. It just says he was a Samaritan. And then you have to study to know what all the implications of that means. He is the one in the story who was good. What was the man's question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Wow. So if my heart's not focused on God and it's not shown through my actions, James and John both imply it or say it directly later, you can't love God if you don't love others. You can't. The man answered the question too. Verse 37, the man said, The one who showed him mercy, the one who went out and did something. And then Jesus goes on to say, You can't just know it and not do it. He says, Go and do likewise. Now the church is doing this. Barnabas is doing this. It's a bold, bold, bold act of love. It's an exposing act. I've got to put my faith and trust in God alone. Did you know what Ananias' name means? It means whom Jehovah has graciously given. Boy, if he'd only realize what his name means. You know, you know Sapphira's. She's a sapphire, a gem, a jewel. <laughs> if he'd only realized his wife was a jewel. He led her to destruction. I'm not saying she wasn't saved or not. We don't know. But we know they didn't have any part with Jesus because they decided to partner with the devil instead. Wow. So we kind of keep on reading from Acts chapter 4 to Acts chapter 5, the story, straight through. Now, meaning basically at the same time, because Luke is telling this as an opposite, that's why the but's there, we have an encouraging story that should uplift us and, and drive us all to live this way, but we have another story also. Now, a man called Ananias, <laughs> who got, whom Jehovah has graciously given, you could put right in there, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. They partnered together even. Now where one is going down this path, they're dra dragging another. He partnered with his wife of all people. With her full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, brought the rest of the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart? That's why it happened. Satan has no power or no dominion. 
He could have said flee from him. He could have followed a different example. But instead he conspired with his wife to bring division, discord into the church. To not love and trust God. Oh, to not, you can't serve both God and money, can you? With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back that part, that's where I have to give you the significance of that word, of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is that Satan has filled your heart so much that you lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? You can't look at the story at face value because you'll think that, like I said, that it mattered about the, keeping some. But even Peter says that so you understand that. Next verse, he says, Didn't it belong to you before you sold it? No one told you you had to do this. And after it was sold, wasn't the money for your, yours at your disposal, disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? We fight a spiritual battle, guys. And whenever things are going in God's direction, Satan's going to come in and say, Did he really say that? Did he really mean love that enemy over here? You know how bad he is, right? Does God really expect that of you? Let's go back to the cookie in the room. <laughs> Don't eat cookies. Go clean your room. Don't build treasures on earth, but build treasures in heaven. And look at the reward you have from that. They're eternal. Moths can't destroy them. Thieves can't come in and steal them. And you won't be dependent upon them. You won't love them. You'll love the Lord. So much that nothing else will matter. I'm not telling you to go sell everything you have. Don't throw rocks at me. But if God calls you to do that, do it. <laughs> if He calls you to sell part, do it. But don't conspire with the devil on why you're going to hold back from God. And if I'm doing that, and I'm telling my, teaching my wife to do that, and teaching my children to do that, what path are we following? The road is broad that leads to destruction. Well, what happened? Well, you know, right? He fell down dead, right? And in verse 5, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom, rather than fear of what can happen to me, which Jesus says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. The Gentiles, the other guys, do that. Instead, know how much you're loved. And he tells us this about that a good father would give good gifts to his child, how much more would your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit, which we just saw empower them to preach so boldly that they did sell land. But now we get this conspiring from the devil in there. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in. Not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, <clears throat> Tell me, if, is this the price that you and I got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to do what? Prepositional phrase again, to test the Spirit of the Lord. Well, this is the extreme we see. Drop down dead that day. But how could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord in any way, any fashion? Think about that. He wants us of one mind, one accord, being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. Listen, Peter said. The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Now remember as we've read this story along, when Peter sees... The lame man, he just immediately, and he didn't get filled with the Spirit, Luke doesn't write, immediately said, I don't got money. I don't got money. We've gave it all away. I don't got money, but I will give you instead, since I'm not trying to serve two masters, what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he did. It blows my mind, I'll say it again, how Peter was that in tune with the Spirit to know that, that the Spirit would actually do that 
healing. I mean, I would have had to say, weak in my faith, oh, let's all gather around elders of the church and lay hands on this guy and let's see if it's in God's will and there's nothing wrong with that. But Peter was so in tune, in step with the Spirit, as Paul says, that he said, get up and walk. And now he's so in tune with the Spirit, I don't know if he saw Ananias coming, but he knew what was coming for Sapphira, didn't he? I, think, I don't think he knew what's coming with Ananias, but that's just what I think. <laughs> I think that made him step back and say, yeah, I'm going to follow you, God. <laughs> I will be a fisher of men because you will make me one. I've already told you I have forsaken everything, and you better believe me, Lord, I mean it. That fear sees the whole church. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus writes these words to the crowd, starting in verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. That's part of what they were doing. That's obvious from that story. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So at best case, best worst case is they weren't building treasures in heaven. We see that. But he goes on to say, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Ananias and Sapphira, if they passed through the flames, their works were destroyed. Can you agree with that? That means they left this world together if they went to heaven, if they went to an eternity with God, whatever, however you want to say that. They left this world spiritually bankrupt. Jesus said, don't build treasures on earth. You know, it is funny, when I do say that verse in teaching children, they immediately say, see, don't. I'm not supposed to do that. But as adults, we try to start reasoning again and get our own wisdom in there and say, well, does that really mean don't? It just means I should focus over here. It says don't. I struggle with it. I'll say it if you don't say it. I struggle with it. Because we have so much. Don't do this, but instead do that. I don't struggle at it with a child's perspective. Don't eat those cookies. Because I know that I'm going to get the cookies plus whatever else later. I know that I'm obeying my parents. I know I'm doing what's right. And I know they're going to take care of me. What good father doesn't give gifts to his child? But you don't give as much to a disobedient child, do you? And you won't be building treasures in heaven like you could be if you're trying to love both and serve both. I mean, that's what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. And it's clear from the scripture that Ananias had conspired with Satan and then conspired with his wife to do this. And just like the rich fool that day, God required his life. Who, th who would think God's ever going to do that? I know Jesus gave that story back there. Well, now you've got the real life example of where he did. And he's in sovereign control of everything. And he gave his one and only son so that not only you could have life, but you could have abundant life here on earth. And as you read and study those scriptures, you'll realize that what he's talking about there is that the religious leaders of the time weren't feeding the sheep and taking care of the sheep properly. It's our job to take care of not just one another, but to take care of anyone, and in so doing so, let our light shine before men that they may see our good works. It's not coincidental that we talked about the, the, the missionaries last week, and I talked to them this week again, because the need is so obvious it goes along with these scriptures again. They are right in the midst of trying to give to the needy and to a point of burnout, especially when Satan's fighting to the point where the child, that they know the, who the child is and everything else on top of that. That it just didn't look like that's going to happen. Wow, the spiritual battles that we fight. Makes you wonder which example you should follow, doesn't it? Well, it's clear. Luke 6, 39, Jesus again said, Can the blind lead the blind? Will they both not fall into a pit? Pretty simple. The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. That's why I'm going back and echoing Jesus' words as we read the, what happened with the church. In Matthew 7, 
13 and 14, he said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus washed his disciples' feet so that they would serve him, even though that would mean they would get dirty. And they would get dirty together, and they would have to wash each other's feet and be there for each other and be prayerfully dependent, be in power and in tune with the Spirit, have the gifts and the fruit that the Spirit gives them in their life. As we read the book of Acts, we'll continue to see this. And like I said, coming up, we'll see wherever that is down the road. We'll see how encouraging Barnabas was to the twelve and how he was to Paul. And you know the ministry that Paul developed because he had Barnabas encouraging him to go along in that ministry. So are you doing your part? Are we doing our part? Because each part makes up the whole. That's why I did the part part. And the question from Shakespeare, not just from the Bible, is to be or not to be. That is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer or to take arms against a whole kind of sea of troubles and by opposing them, end them. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're still here until he returns, being the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Are you in it with me? Are you in it with Jesus? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are so mighty, awesome, beyond words. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, help us to pray that daily as Jesus taught. Lord, do we know it's not about us because so easily we get distracted and think it's about us and we think it's about providing for our families and the things we need when you feed the birds of the field. Oh, Lord, you're such a gracious God and you've given us so many blessings here in this country and this, even, even more in this region that we live in. Help us to take, not take lightly how rich we are, but to use it richly to you, to be bold in proclaiming the gospel message, to look for opportunities to be united together as a priestly unit, to know that Satan has no power, no dominion in our lives, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith to long for the day and help me by the way we live to usher in that day when Jesus Christ returns. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen. Sweetly, Lord, have we worthy thee calling, come follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling, lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the path.